Okay. So, all right. Welcome everyone to the latest virtual monthly installment of the uh, monthly EFF Austin meetup. We hold these on the second Tuesday of every month at 7 p.m. Um, we had tentative plans um, to begin discussing when we might uh, bring these meetings back to uh, meet space as we have been uh, here in cyberspace for more than a year. But uh, given the recent Delta surge, which is uh, especially bad in the Austin Central Texas area, we have unfortunately had to hold off on those plans for the time being. So you're going to continue to find us here uh, in cyberspace for the time being. Um, we will keep you abreast of our plans as when we think it will be safe to eventually resume in-person meetups. We hope to have some kind of hybrid meetup structure where we will be back to meeting in person at Capital Factory, but that we can retain some of the advantages we have enjoyed hosting the meetups with our Zoom uh, room, such as the ease of people who it's hard to go downtown still attending the meetup, as well as being able to pull a more diverse set of speakers who are not necessarily based in Austin. So we hope to get the, uh, the best of both worlds because um, while there are many advantages, I certainly do miss going uh, to the bar and having a drink with people afterwards. It's a little not the same in a Zoom room. Um, so stay tuned on announcements about our future plans as Delta develops. Um, also, if you've not attended in a little bit, you may notice that our permissions are a little more locked down than the last time you attended. We basically had uh, some trolls uh, cause some mischief for our June speaker. So, um, you know, I unfortunately, I guess the meetups have gotten popular enough where it's just the internet and this is why we can't have nice things. But my desire to try to have this resemble our freewheeling in-person meetups as much as possible is simply no longer possible. So you will note that you cannot unmute yourself. You can only chat with me and um, you cannot share your screen. Um, trust me, these are for your protection. If you've been here in June, you would understand. So um, basically the way this is going to work is the following. Um, our speaker, who I will introduce in a moment, is going to give his talk. Um, if you have questions, you'll note you can still chat to me. Please chat me your question. And then when we get to the Q&A portion, I will um, basically um, either read your question or I can also ask you to unmute yourself and we can uh, hear from you at that time. I can manage one of you unmuted at a time. So hopefully uh, everything else will go smoothly. But basically we're gonna, the speakers can give their talk and save your questions, chat them at me and we'll get to them um, afterwards. So now that the boring business business is out of the way. Um, so I'm first just gonna do a little, for those of you who are new, I'm gonna do an announcement um to let um you all know um what um we've been up to so basically mostly we're just continuing the virtual meetups at this point in time so um so basically um as i said there's second tuesday of every month at 7 p.m we have a speaker lined up uh for september i'm still actively soliciting speakers for the rest of the year if you uh, know somebody or you yourself think you might be able to speak on a topic of interest, please get at me. I'm uh, always looking for speakers. And for those of you who are new, who somehow stumbled into this, who are like, what is EFF Austin? Well, EFF Austin, um, we are an Austin-based digital sub liberties organization. We are closely affiliated with Electronic Frontier Foundation based out of San Francisco. Um, you can basically, if you've never heard of them, you can think of them as the ACLU for the internet and emerging technologies. They protect um, things like net neutrality, end-to-end -end encryption, um, protecting Section 230 of the CDA, whole bunch of nerdy, technical, wonky stuff at the intersection of tech and law that basically tries to keep your civil liberties protected in emerging technological spaces. They're cool people, you should support them. If you're not based in Austin, they have a thing called the EFA or the Electronic Frontier Alliance. You should um, you know, see if your area has a chapter. If they do not, you should consider joining one. But I'm happy to chat with you about any of this uh, in more detail uh, in the chat. Um, also, I'll say that we actually do um, do a virtual happy hour in our friend, Mike Furstenfeld's Gather Town space that will probably be happening after this. I will share a link on how to join it in the chat if you're interested in hanging out with us socially after this. Um, so yeah, 
that's the main stuff, just continuing our meetups. We did have some tentative plans to try to start getting some in-person events and gatherings and socializations going again, but those have mostly been put on hold. Um, we're continuing to follow certain also various legislative things going on here in Texas. Um, I'm happy to discuss that work with anyone who is interested, but also I don't want to ramble on too long. So I'm probably going to introduce our speaker and get started here, but we can discuss uh, more about EFF Austin afterwards if you're curious or you're welcome during the talk to message me in the chat and I can answer any question you have. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce well, first of all, actually, real quick, um, there is at I generally in tradition in our in person meetups, I ask the community if they want to make any announcements. That's uh, you know basically share anything with the community that they think would be of interest to the Visual Civil Liberties community. Obviously, it's a little more locked down now. So basically, if you do have something you want shared with the whole group, once again, feel free to message it to me, and I will share it with everyone. That being said, our good friend uh, Owen McNally, who is here, did want to make a uh, announcement so i'm going to temporarily give him some mod powers here so he can go ahead and talk to you about his announcement so i've just made owen a co-host so he should be able to unmute himself and uh, make his announcement <laughs> okay thanks kevin i just wanted to say quickly uh that some of us in eff austin have a cybersecurity working group and we are looking for volunteers. If anybody is interested in cybersecurity related topics, we've met before to talk about machine learning applied to cybersecurity. We've looked at the security of voting machines and the integrity of Travis County's uh, communications to voters and, and met with the county last November, uh, November I think it was. And we've, uh, we've often met with other uh, industry professionals to just uh, get updates and compare notes on what's happening. So if that appeals to you, please uh, uh, let me know or, or let Kevin know. But we, we certainly would like anyone who wants to learn more or wants to volunteer for our small group dealing with very interesting topics, the more the merrier. And I'll just also flag that, um, you know, we don't have a formal working group, but especially um, if you know you are interested in more the legislative activism side of things, uh, do let me know because there are several bills very misguided uh, before the Texas special session right now that are frankly kind of terrifyingly awful. There's one in particular called SB8 that while it's not directly related to digital civil liberties, basically if it passed, it would legalize Stasi tactics of letting private citizens like sue anything they don't like and instead of like suing the government they can sue other private citizens and get paid by the government to do this it's basically paid informants so it's kind of horrible so yeah if you want to get more involved in the legislative side of things get at me there's also we're in the early stages of exploring trying to craft robust data privacy regulations for the 2023 session here in texas there were some attempts not horrible, but not great in the last session that nothing came of them. So we're kind of, with some of our allies up in Dallas and elsewhere, we are plotting our next steps. So anywho, I'm now going to introduce our speaker and we're going to get started. So um, our speaker this month is uh, Casey O'Brien. Casey is the Assistant Director for Cyber Defense Education and Training with the Information Trust Institute and the Granger College of Engineering at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Casey has more than 25 years of large-scale information security and IT engineering implementation and management experience in challenging and cutting-edge public and private sector environments. And um, Casey today is going to be talking to us about a topic that I think even those of us who do programming for a living and know a bit about uh, IT and InfoSec may not know a lot about, except when we hear occasional news stories about like hackers got into the power grid operational technology. Operational technology or OT refers to systems used to monitor events, processes, and devices, and to make adjustments in industrial operations. As these systems and networks converge with enterprise IT, it's imperative that IT personnel understand the business cultural and technical drivers that make OT different. This talk will focus on some of these differences. And uh, without further ado, I'm gonna turn things over to our speaker, Casey, take it away. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Owen. Uh, good to see you all. 
So without further ado, let's get into it. Top 10 things IT needs to know about OT. So, so first off, the term operational technology comes from IT folks, and we could use industrial control systems in its place, but I liked the sound of OT for IT rather than ICS for IT. <clears throat> so I went with that. Um, secondly, I am really, really, really new to this whole uh, industrial control systems slash operational technology world. I have an IT and cybersecurity background. I've been working professionally since about 1993, primarily in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and while I worked in a manufacturing facility and saw firsthand some of the automation technologies and um, programmable logic controllers and other sort of uh, other sort of technology used in a manufacturing facility to, to essentially make refrigeration units for trucks. I'm new to OT in general. In fact, that's the slides I'm using a sort of a template from my uh, from the organization that I joined in in February. So that I've been with for six months and that's Information Trust Institute and the Information Trust Institute within the College of Engineering at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign focuses, uh, at, well, on a number of critical infrastructure related projects, um, but is really known for um, power grid security, physical, cyber sort of system security. And, and so that being said, this discussion, if you will, is really informed by me coming from an IT and cybersecurity background and trying to make sense of the business drivers and the technologies and the security controls and the cultural differences, the personnel differences between this IT world that I was very familiar with and this new operational technology space, which I'm less familiar with. And so this presentation and this discussion is really informed by this. And I've learned a ton as I engage with folks from academia, government entities like the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, and, and asset owners in the, in the operational technology space from small municipalities in central Illinois to, you know, to large sort of, um, um, large organizations, both in the government and industry space. And, you know, as the convergence of enterprise and OT systems continues, something that's been happening for about 10 years, I think it's important for IT folks to understand some of what I'm going to discuss in order to help this continued convergence be successful, whatever that means for your organization. And last but not least, even though this is a you know, build a sort of a, not sort of as a top 10 list, these slides are not in any order of importance or just, they're just, you know, 10 through one, starting with number 10. All right. So number 10, in most cases, the A in the CIA triad, that is the confidentiality, integrity, availability triad trumps the other two. Um, so, oh, oh my bad. I'm looking at the wrong slide here. I got my, uh, I got my, I got to get my slides uh, squared here. Sorry about that. Number ten. OT operators are more like mechanical, electrical engineers than computer cybersecurity people. Um, so this is really the personnel side of operational technology. So if we look at, for example, to use some broad brushstrokes here, educational background. And IT is often folks coming from computer science, information technology, information systems, cybersecurity. In operational technology, the educational background of personnel is often um, on the job, if you will, the school of hard knocks, um, or folks coming from career and technical education, um, what was once called VoTech. And career and technical education, CTE, is something often you'll see in high schools um, and it may be a special magnet school or um, a high school that offers um, courses and apprenticeship programs for example in construction or heating ventilation air conditioning hvac or um, maybe uh, to become an electrician um, sometimes they'll have perhaps an it or 
um, computer networking focus at these career and technical education, something all like a, a Cisco network and academy. Um, and oftentimes the operators, in addition to getting their sort of education on the job and or coming from current technical education programs, oftentimes these folks are also have engineering backgrounds of the mechanical electrical variety. In terms of a reporting chain, in IT, it's often a chief information security officer slash chief information officer in, in terms of the reporting up chain. In, in operational technology, it's often, um, say, a technician um, or, or an electrical engineer, for example, that's responsible for maintaining the OT systems, uh, reporting to a shift supervisor who reports to a plant manager who reports to a chief operating officer. And, they, and this sort of makes sense when you think about what's being controlled. In IT, what's being controlled is data. In operational technology environments, what's being controlled is some physical process, right? It's physics at play, if you will. The measurement of what's being controlled in IT, that is data, is bits and bytes. And in the latter, in operational technology, what's being controlled is things or what's being measured are things like temperature, pressure, flow, levels, et cetera. All right, so, so different personnel. All right, here's where I got ahead of myself. In most cases, the A, availability in the CIA triad, the confidentiality, integrity, availability triad, which is a popular model for thinking about how you uh, how you essentially can engineer and administer systems to make sure that they only provide data to people that are supposed to see that data and that that data is accurate and that it's available. So in, in the operational technology or industrial control system space, oftentimes availability is trumps the other two. That is the A in the CIA tri triad um, reigns king over confidentiality and, and, and integrity. And, and the point here is really just what are the desired system characteristics, essentially. And in IT systems, the desired system characteristics are typically, as I mentioned, confidentiality. Uh, make sure that only the people that are supposed to see, for example, um, sensitive data can see that. And that that data is correct. That's the integrity part. Uh, and that it's available when users want to get to it. When we're talking about desired system characteristics in operational technology, it's usually um, safety, reliability, and controllability. Perhaps not in that order, but um, depending on the, um, the, um, the, the, the vertical that you're working in, if you will, it's some variation of safety, reliability, and controllability. And there is some overlap between IT and OT in terms of desired system characteristics, and that is integrity. Um, and so there is some overlap there. Number eight, OT systems slash networks are created to last as long as possible without upgrades and patches. So just to sort of provide some contrasts between operational technology and information technology environments, OT environments are relatively static as requirements do not change often. OT system slash network upgrades happen during specific operational maintenance periods. And OT systems have a life cycle of 15 to 20 years versus the life cycle of an IT system um, ranging somewhere between three and five years. Um, Owen asked a question, are medical devices a subset of operational technology? Um, I, I, think you, I, I think one could argue that they are, um, right? Especially if there if are, if those medical devices are controlling some sort of a, a physical process. So if they are, if they're, um, you know, dripping insulin into a patient's arm, for example, that that system. And if that system is designed to do nothing but that, um, that would be an example of a, you know of a of a field level device, if you will, it to sort of use OT speak, um, right? So it's sort of the main thing to think about is you know is it an operational technology device? Is is it, is it controlling some physical 
process of some sort. And if it is, then it, you know, then it's of, of the OT variety. So thanks for that question, Owen. Number seven, OT systems and networks may be managed slash installed by IT hobbyists within small businesses. And this slide really dovetails with slide number 10, where, where I was talking about the types of uh, operational technology operators, right? Being more like mechanical slash electrical engineers or technicians than computer cyber security people. And in, and in many small um, organizations, especially small municipalities, you know, oftentimes, um, you know, it's the IT person who is dual hatted or multi hatted to also then manage and administer and um, and support the operational technology systems and networks. And they may, in fact, have no real training or background in those operational technology systems and or networks. Remote management number six is required for operators and vendors. And this comes out of um, a, a fairly um, uh, recent February-ish, so about six months ago, um, incident in Oldsmar, Florida, which is near, near Tampa Bay, um, with the small municipality where a cyber, uh, a cyber criminal used a remote access software program called TeamViewer, um, which is very popular, not only used um, in, in operational technology environments, but in, but in IT environments, right? essentially gives, gives a remote administrator or consultant or contractor remote access to the system. Um, and that, that cyber criminal increased the sodium hydroxide levels in the Oldsmar, Florida's water supply to dangerous levels. It turns out that the uh, administrator was sitting at the console and saw, um, it happened to be a, a man, his cursor moving uh, and saw the changes being made uh, to the human machine interface, the HMI, the, the software that's used to actually change the levels of sodium hydroxide um, in the water supply and was able to change those, those levels back. And then, and then in real time saw the cyber criminal making those changes um, a second time. Um, and so in this case, the, you know, the, the, what could have been a very dangerous situation was averted, but there, all, there also are, are other security controls in place, physical controls in place, physical systems that also were set up to look for those sorts of things. Um, but this is a, a, an absolute reality of the, of the OT world, which is remote management is required for operators, excuse me, I'm sorry, and vendors. Number five, it looks like uh, Kevin posted a link to an NPR article. Thanks, Kevin, about that. Number five, low-skill criminal hackers are using remote access of operational technology devices to pivot into IT networks. And what allows this to happen is um, organizations not um, doing proper network segmentation, right? Essentially putting all of their systems, those systems that are on the enterprise IT side of the house on the same networks as those systems um, that are part of the operational technology um, side of an organization, if you will. And so being able to get onto a system, any system on uh, a network that's engineered in, in a flat manner, as I just described, then allows an attacker um, criminal to cyber criminal to pivot then and move laterally across that network, looking for other other rich targets, if you will, other other easy to compromise systems. Um, and you know there are a number of playbooks that we can rely on um, that that allow us to implement effective security practices. Um, and some of these, you know, go back 20, 30 years in many cases, um, and, and certainly 20 in the case of uh, an effective security control is to, um, when possible, segment your network systems, and especially enterprise and OT, you know, as, as an example, um, you know, so there's another high profile critical infrastructure 
compromise more recently, more recent than the Oldsmar one in Florida in February. And that, that was the colonial pipeline attack. And so in that case, the, the attackers were able to compromise a billing slash enterprise resource planning system on the enterprise IT side of the house. Right, so they're able to compromise an ERP system that did, amongst other things, billing of customers for Colonial Pipeline. So Colonial Pipeline moves lots and lots and lots of millions of gallons um, of gasoline across a pipeline from Texas on up into um, the eastern seaboard in the mid-Atlantic region of the United States. And, and as such, then they can bill the recipients or customers of, the, of that gasoline, for example. And, and so move that however many millions of gallons to Baltimore Washington International Airport and then you know bill customers at BWI accordingly. Um, so the attack in this case was on the enterprise IT side. It wasn't actually a compromise of the operational technology network itself. It wasn't a compromise of the computers and systems that actually literally moved the millions of gallons, in my example here, from Texas to Baltimore, for example, right? Though those systems were not compromised. They were, they were functioning fine. Um, but since Colonial Pipeline had no way, um, at least... Uh, um, in an automated fashion to bill customers for the moving of millions of gallons of gasoline from one location to another, and also coupled with a fear that perhaps then to my previous slide about sort of being able to move laterally from one network to another, um, Colonial Pipeline decided to to shut down their their um, their their operational technology systems out of an abundance of caution, uh, and that's sort of a nuanced distinction, right? It's a nuanced distinction that in this case, it really the, the operational technology systems were not compromised, and it did create some panic because of really um, poor reporting, quite frankly. Um, and at at that point, I was um, I was living in Baltimore, and you know where the runs and on the gas, you know, like certain gas stations and, you know, people, you know, you, see, you might have seen pictures or videos of people, you know, literally filling up plastic trash bags um, with gasoline for this fear of, you know, we're going to run out of gasoline. Well, there really was no imminent danger of running out of gasoline. It just turned out that, you know, when you have these converging enterprise IT and operational technology networks, a compromise to one can impact the other. <clears throat> Excuse me. Number four, operational technology folks have different business priorities and there are different cultures. And so some examples include, so think of managerial accounting, right? And this is, this is the practice where you identify, you measure, you analyze, you interpret, and you communicate financial information to managers for the pursuit of an organization's goals. So when we think about managerial accounting, information technology is a cost center, whereas operational technology is a profit center. Um, and so when you're responsible for the driving the revenue for an organization, the priorities and the culture is going to be completely different than if you're seen as a cost to the organization. In terms of just some other operational technology business priorities, oftentimes OT, the OT shops in an organization have um, their budget is just big enough for any some sort of a physical failure or um, their budgets are big enough for large expensive OT de devices, for example. Um, and they also don't really see cybersecurity as their area. That's somebody else's problem. You know, it goes back to the sort of desired system characteristics, which for OT fall in the reliability, safety, controllability domains. Um, you know, the other, uh, other big difference between OT and IT is just that operational technology is really about keeping systems stable and avoiding changes versus this constant changing state in information technology.
Number three, access control is non-existent at the field device level. So, excuse me, what I mean by access control here is any hardware, any software, any administrative policy or some sort of procedure that helps enact a policy that controls access to resources. That's, that's access control. And it's, it's one of many security controls that organizations could implement. Um, and I mentioned another, which is segmenting your networks. Um, the systems that are publicly facing on the internet should be segmented and separated from the systems that are used to control some sort of physical process in the plant. And that should, those systems should be segmented from the, um, say, internal sort of enterprise IT systems, right? So access control is a, is a security control, one of many. And the goal with access control is to provide access to authorized subjects. So for example, users and prevent unauthorized access attempts. Well, when we're talking about field device, um, devices that are sort of in the field, if you will, I mentioned, you know, in responding to Owen's question about our medical device as a subset of OT, you know, well, if that, if the device in the hospital is used to, in my example, administer some, some uh, certain amount of insulin to a patient, for example, um, right, that, that's in, in this, in, in this context, that's a, that's a field, dev, a field level device, if you will, oftentimes, access controls non-existence in uh, in those devices and so what that means is that um, you have to get creative and think about other ways in which you can provide security controls when the device th itself doesn't allow for it another example is you'll hear a lot in the it security realm about patching 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 um and so for example, speaking of medical devices to Owen's question, well, you know, some, some field level devices have to get certification. They have to be certified by the FDA, for example. Uh, and they're, you know, and they're, they're single purpose built devices. They're running a specific operating system with specific software that's designed to to control a, a some sort of a physical process and the, the you know the the administering of some sort of drug on at certain intervals based on some sort of reading you know blood level or whatnot and um and and that device has been certified by the Food and Drug Administration for example to run that specific operating system at some specific patch level. And so when you're talking about patching in this context, um, it's not realistic and or even doable in this example um, to actually patch a system. And so while patching is a very effective security control, in my example, and other sorts of other examples in the operational technology world, uh, it, it's not an option. And so, nor is access control, right? This, uh, this ability to use hardware or software, for example, to prevent unauthorized access attempts. So you have to get creative in the ways in which you, you will provide other security controls to, to secure that device. Um, is there any overlap between, o so it's a question from Ham's Labs. Is there any overlap between OT and Internet of Things security? It seems like big IOT companies are beginning to take security more seriously. And once they find good best practices, do you see this making its way into the industrial space? There is a lot of, thanks for that question, Ham's Lab. There is a lot of overlap um, between OT and the Internet of Things, um, you know, many of these Internet of Things are are um, sensors. They're they're microcontrollers. There's some sort of a physical hardware device. It's typically running some sort of embedded operating system, usually on a you know software on a chip, um, firmware, if you will. Um, it has a, a networking stack. Um, you know, the newer Internet of Things. IOT devices um, are, are, are ready to be connected to the internet. Um, and so, and you're seeing a huge increase in the number of these, these IOT devices being implemented in all sorts of critical infrastructure, manufacturing facilities, um, 
uh, perhaps a state will use these sensors to, um, they'll put them on, on freeways to measure the temperature and then send an alert when it you know, gets below a certain um, temperature to um, the folks that need to then you know, get out the salt trucks um, because the roads are freezing or excuse me, you'll see these used a lot in, in agriculture um, to measure soil temperature um, and get readings on soil temperature to then automatically churn on watering systems and whatnot. And so there's a ton, a lot, a lot of these devices being placed in OT environments. And when I mentioned convergence of enterprise IT and OT, this sort of a really good example, these internet of things. Um, and, you know, general, our companies. Um, beginning to take security more seriously. I, you know, I don't, I don't, it, it, it not really, you know, um, these, these things are, you know, they're designed um, not with effective security practices in mind. So you'll see um, default credentials that can't be changed on these IOT devices, you know, username, admin, password, admin, um, or um, rely on, protocols that historically um, are um, secure protocols that allow an administrator remote access, for example, where anything typed and sent from the administrator or technician's system to that IoT device is sent in the clear. Um, so, uh, you know, unfortunately, um, these IoT devices are not really being designed with security and practice, certainly. I mean, I'm I, many uh, many are not, some are, but the preponderance are not. Um, and so while there are effective practices that these <clears throat> manufacturers of these IoT devices could rely on, oftentimes they're not. Um, number two, data used for reconnaissance of the OT environment is most likely within the enterprise IT network. Um, meaning here, so, um, so, so cyber criminals oftentimes will rely on, on getting a detailed or, or building a detailed profile of a target system that they want to compromise, at least certainly mature and sophisticated um, cyber criminals will. And oftentimes this phase of the attack is referred to as the reconnaissance or information gathering or, or, or the cyber criminals will rely on open source intelligence gathering techniques that is using search engines um, and way and other sorts of various open source or publicly available resources to to build a profile of their of their target entity and and, and the idea here is simply that oftentimes if an attacker wants to compromise an OT system um, they can they can more than not find information about that OT environment from resources on the enterprise IT side of the network. So for example, they might find network topologies um, showing how the, you know, how the various networks are, are, are connected together. They may find usernames. Um, they may find job titles of folks working on the OT side of the house. They may find information about how the OT systems operate or project files for OT devices or work schedules or planned holidays and vacations where people are gonna be gone. So use that as an opportunity then to carry out your attack at that time when those folks are gonna be gone or, or various device names and models. Um, and, and, and last but not least, impact to an industrial control system device requires a high degree of skill that requires access to the actual devices to learn. And in a way, this is a good thing, right? These are, you know, for the most part, you don't see a lot of simulated or virtual instances of industrial control systems. It doesn't mean they don't exist, but for the most part, in order to learn about these industrial control system devices themselves, you oftentimes have to have physical access to the device itself. And you have to have some sort of a system that's either connected to it, or you have a system that you connect to it, and then you have to learn how to use whatever sort of 
tool and or software that's used to interface between you and and the and the industrial control system device itself. Um, and it takes time to develop the knowledge and skill about how to, you know, sort of read the the data coming from that industrial control system and perhaps how to make changes to it and and whatnot. And in a way, this is the sort of a built-in security control, if you will, um, right? As as we see more simulated and or virtual instances of industrial control systems, um, that'll give more that'll give uh, access to to more folks to to learn about these devices and whatnot. So, um, see there are a couple questions. Can you define and or offer observations on SCADA and telematics? Um, I'm not uh, I'm not sure what telematics means, Owen. Um, uh, observations, you know, SCADA is a, you know, is a form of an industrial control system. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the sort of um, anything related in this presentation to industrial control systems themselves, you know, that are, um, that are used specifically those devices used to control some sort of a physical process, a lot of the same stuff still applies, you know, long life cycles, um, the people that are maintaining those SCADA systems are um, supervisory control and data acquisition is what SCADA stands for. Um, they, they tend to be of the sort of variety I described earlier, they tend to either be engineers or have some sort of a, uh, maybe some sort of a, a background from career and technical education. Um, those systems, uh, um, oftentimes their controlling processes are at, that are at the heart of how the organization makes its money. Um, so they're super critical to the, the bottom line of the organization. Um, they, um, they're not really designed to be um, updated. Um, you know, they weren't really designed with security in mind. They were designed with, availability and reliability and safety in mind. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of the, the sort of things I was talking about is related to industrial control systems um, applies to applies to SCADA. Um, oh, so telematics. All right, sort of, all right, sort of, you know, all right, so telemetry, um, gotcha. Um, I mean, I don't, you know, it's not really an area I know, I know a little bit, you know, to be dangerous, just from sort of my interest in Formula One racing and sort of the, the telemetry or telematics of, you know, those systems, but, you know, in, in essence, it's sort of this, the same sort of issues at play here, right? You have some sort of a, some sort of a microcontroller, mini computer, some sort of a sensor that's designed to, it's designed to control some process to read uh, and to interface and communicate with a system that, you know, is either looking at, you know, air pressure in tires or fuel usage or, um, you know, gas mixtures. In the case you mentioned, um, you know, global, uh, well, you didn't say rocket technology, but, you know, automotive systems, and then make sure those values are within reason and are within a sort of, you know, a desired range. And if, you know, if the gas mixture range increases beyond a desired value, send an alert then to some sort of a system. In the case of telemetry and the Formula One example, you know, uh, wirelessly, right? Um, to then, a, you know, some sort of a, a, a console where you've got a team looking at that and then and then alert the driver, hey, you know, the gas mixture looks weird or, you know, engines running hot or, you know, back right tire pressure is low and we need you, you got to take a pit stop now, right? Um, so in a way, you know, the telemetry technology relies on a lot of these controller sensors that are much like, if you will, sort of industrial control systems. In my example, you know, it's not the, the it's not um, <laughs> it's not used in a manufacturing facility. It's used in a, you know a, a high performance car, um, but sort of you know relates the same. Hope, hopefully that answers your question, Owen. Um, let's see, Daniela, 
with the advent of Internet of Things, connectivity between OT and the cloud, does the Purdue, Purdue model still hold true? You know, I've heard, Daniela, that the per, Purdue model does not hold true. And I know, again, I'm really new to this space. And so, so I'm sort of, I'm sort of, um, you know, I know enough to be dangerous. I say that I, I took a two day Idaho National Laboratory industrial control system security training. There was a lot of discussion around this sort of Purdue model. Um, and, you know, maybe you could sort of enlighten us on what the Purdue model is. Uh, but my understanding is, is doesn't, it doesn't, um, it doesn't hold true. So that's, you know, sorry, I can't sort of speak more to that, Daniel. It sounds like you probably know more than I do in that regard. Um, Evan Brown wants to ask if you have any suggestions or resources for someone who wants to get into security as an occupation. Um, well, certainly, um, maybe I can come back to that one after I provide a couple um, a couple resources for folks to, to check out. Um, so, and I, I, it looks like Danielle has another question. Most new IoT edge devices require connectivity directly to the cloud, such as Azure IoT Hub. Do you feel the federal government should establish rigorous guidelines for OT like NIST and others have done? I do, Danielle. That's actually a great segue into some of the additional resources that I've that I've put that I've found and put together for folks from the IT side. Now, this specifically is a great segue, Danielle. So thank you for your question. Uh, and, and these are just a, a sample of additional resources that, that sort of get at um, Danielle, Daniela's question. So the first one is the National Institute of Standards and Technology Special Publication 800-82, and it's titled Guide to Industrial Control System Security, and the URL's there. And I, I'll make these slides available to, to Kevin and Owen and the, and the Austin FF folks. Um, so publications in the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, if you're not familiar, they have this special SP, uh, is the acronym, excuse me, um, series. It's the SP 800 series or special publication 800 series. And they present information of interest to the computer security community. They've been around for a long time. And they this series, the SP 800 series has, they're comprised of guidelines, recommendations, there's technical specs. They have annual reports um, of NIST cybersecurity activities. And while these special publication 800 series pubs are developed to address and support the security and privacy needs of US federal government information information systems, they have wide applicability to non-government information um, systems and also OT systems. And so um, this, is, this is a good example of one. This, this 800-82 special publication provides a comprehensive security approach for security industrial control systems. And it, it also addresses unique performance, reliability, and safety requirements, uh, and then talks about how you can implement security controls from a separate NIST special publication, that's SP800-53 in an OT environment. Re revision two is the link that I have showing. That's the quote unquote final version of this special publication. It was released, I think, in 2015. Revision three is in draft form. It was published in April of 2021, and they're currently in a call for comment stage. So that's a good resource. And Daniela, that that's got some some um, some good guidelines that speak specifically to your question. So thanks for your question. Um, and Daniela. Um, to me directly posted a, uh, let me just copy this, um, a link to the Purdue model. Um, and let me just paste that if I can, or maybe Kevin, you can do that. I did not mean to do that. I did so, share a link to uh, the Wikipedia page th on it, though thanks. I will admit I had not heard of the model before myself. <laughs> so thank uh, you. New to me. Appreciate that. Um, so that's one resource. Speaking of NIST, they also have a OT cybersecurity program. So here the idea is that cybersecurity risk management is super, super, super important to help ensure the safety and, and reliable delivery of the goods and services provided and supported by operational technology. And so this program 
is uh, has a bunch of collaborative projects from across the NIST information technology and engineering laboratories. So that's a that's a good resource for um, IT folks wanting to get a handle sort of on the um, on this intersection of um, OT and cybersecurity. CISA, I mentioned them earlier, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, which is really an offshoot of the Department of Homeland Security, has some recommended practices. I mean, I like that they didn't, that they use recommended practices versus best. I like sort of recommended or effective because best practices can be subjective. Um, recommended are based on things that have worked and effective are based on things that have been proven through some sort of evidence-based means to, to make a difference. Um, and there's that URL is available for folks to check out what CISA, um, if you're not familiar with CISA, they are amongst other things, look at enterprise, they, they look at risk management at the government level. They're responsible for securing the .gov domain. And they also have as part of their sort of core mission to, to work with um, asset owners, to, to work with those organizations who are part of the critical infrastructure, those, those things that are so important for the functioning of a civil society that, you know, any sort of compromise of them would be detrimental to sort of civil, a civil society, you know, transportation, banking, healthcare, um, you know, elect electricity, um, water treatment, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so um, CISA does a lot in the industrial control system space, and they've got some recommended security practices. Um, Idaho National Lab, I mentioned when I was responding to Daniela's question about the Purdue model, and is it still an effective model? My understanding is the answer is no. Um, Idaho National Lab has a, an industrial control system community of practice, and it's comprised of subject matter experts across industry, academia, and government, and I've participated in those, and they're really very good. And they've, they've got a number of working groups that focus on things like education and training and development and career pathways and hands-on exercises. And, um, and so, um, and it's got a really strong industry. Um, it has strong industry participation and support. And so I'd encourage you to check out the INL Community of Practice and the URLs there. Um, CISA has a bunch of courses available at no cost. So this is getting into the OT cybersecurity training and certifications and that URL is there. Um, there's the International Society, Society of Automation and International Electrotechnical Commission. They've got some certifications. If you want to um, check out some certifications in the US, there's of course, SANS Institute. I don't work for SANS. Uh, this isn't a plug for SANS, but they also have high quality, um, also high cost um, training in, in industrial control systems. And there's some contact information. I know we're coming up on the hour here. Um, Kevin asked a question. Do you feel that device makers are making many parts of OT networks, IoT things, devices when it, that isn't necessary to their functioning and creating a security hole that doesn't justify the benefits the internet connectivity may offer? You know, I'm not sure about that. Um, you know, I, I, all I do know is that, you know, these IoT devices, they're, they're not going away and there's going to be billions of them in various sorts of critical infrastructure environments. And that generally speaking, um, the, the sorts of security holes in these devices are things we've known how to fix and deal with for years. And so in a way, it's sort of depressing to see that we're repeating these past um, failures, if you want. I, I mentioned some examples before. Owen asks, is there a big personnel gap with OT security training like there is with cybersecurity and a similar OT security trainer shortage? There is, yeah, there, there is a big need for for folks that that can special that know about operational technology itself or the technologies, and then actually, right, know sort of the limitations of how you can't just and that's sort of my main takeaway. You can't just take these affect a lot of these effective practices from IT and cybersecurity and bolt them onto the OT world, um, right? There's different business drivers. There's different challenges. There's different sort of competing cultures, if you will, and you have to understand those differences 
right first and then and certainly have to understand the operational technology itself and then understand what well what are the kinds of security controls that i can implement in an ot environment um, and and i and i you know i will say that the ot community is is relatively small and um, people are really experienced and super passionate um and you know and while there is training available um, I think there is absolutely a need for more of it. So that there's my contact information. I'm happy, you know, I, it's right at the top of the hour. I want to, I'll stop there. I'm happy to stay on and answer any questions if I can. I know there's another one from Daniela and Owen, and, and I'm happy to continue to, you know, stay on for a few minutes. I want to be respectful of people's times, Kev. Well, I will say that uh, we traditionally hold these meetups uh, for two hours, the talks vary widely. I usually encourage the formal talk to not last that long, but um, you know we have uh, plenty of time if people still have questions they want to ask you. So um, I don't okay. think we need to feel rushed. That being said, whenever questions do naturally peter out, you know it is our room. So you know I I have no problem ending it whenever things reach their natural conclusion point. Um, these meetups are flexible. <laughs> Sounds good, Daniela. <clears throat> Um, hope it's okay to share Danielle. Was, she sent it to me. The Senate just introduced Senate 2439 titled DHS Industrial Capabilities Enhancement of 2021, which will, require, which will require critical infrastructure, oil and gas, pipelines, transmission lines, et cetera, to report to CISA within 72 hours of a breach. Bill is under review but it would impact the liability for private companies much like HIPAA and Sarbanes-Oxley did for the business networks. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Danielle, is it, um, so is it, it, so you say it does require, so it is a requirement. Oftentimes these sorts of um, legislative actions um, don't carry much, they don't have much, uh, and they don't have much in the way of enforcement, right? It's sort of on your honor system, but you say that they it will require these organizations and critical infrastructure and that that's, I think, a good thing. So thanks for sharing that. Who are some of the thought leaders in the OT security space? Um, folks like Rob Lee from, um, from Dragos. So, you know, um, Bryson Bort from Grimm, um, Tom Van Norman from Grimm. So the big, the big companies, the two biggies, in my opinion, you know, in the space, and there are, there are others, but um, um, Dragos and Grimm, G-R-I-M-M, -M, um, they're sort of, they sort of sit at the intersection of OT and cybersecurity. And there's certainly others, but they're, they're the, they're certainly the, 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 the biggest players, I think. Um, and you see quite a bit from principals in those organizations. Um, and folks within those organizations. Um, um, Leslie Carhart from Dragos. Um, um, in the education space, you have folks like uh, Dennis Scar from Everett Community College, who was with Air National Guard and led uh, uh, security assessments of, of ICS systems. And I was building an educational program at a community college in Washington State. There's Capital Technology University in um, in Maryland, um, in Prince George's County, sort of near where DC, Northern Virginia and Maryland all converge. And they've got, um, they've got a graduate program in industrial control systems. You know, there isn't in the education space, there isn't a lot in the way of I, uh, industrial control systems programs. There's maybe, you know, a couple handfuls tops. Um, and part of that is because it's, it's expensive to equip um, these schools with the necessary physical gear they need. I mean, the investments can run as high as 250 plus thousand um, for, the, for the necessary equipment to give students the hands-on that they need to, you know, to get access to, you know, programmable, programmable logic controllers and the hu human machine interfaces and, and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, I'm, I, my take on it, again, being really new to this space, and sort of coming from the IT cybersecurity world is that, you know, it will remain a niche, 
um, right? And that the real driver for educational programs to create degrees and certificates in industrial control systems will be driven by industry needs. They'll be in an area, for example, where, you know, there may be a large, um, you know, pipeline organization or, um, right, or uh, a, 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 some sort of manufacturing facility that's going to require folks with these skills. Um, so hopefully, Owen, that answers it. And um, you all may know some other thought leaders in this space. Um, you mentioned, Kevin asked, you mentioned that the same few mistakes keep getting made over and over again with regards to OT security. What do you think the most effective way to fix these problems would be? <sighs> that, that's a really good question, Kevin. You know, I've been working in IT and and cybersecurity but starting out in IT since 1993. And, you know, if anything, we have more and more systems connected and, you know, we seem to be making the same sorts of mistakes. Uh, and I think part of the challenge is that we're not studying playbooks. What I mean by that is we're not going back and looking at past attacks and compromises and learning how um, how those were carried out and what effective mitigation techniques were put in place. Um, that's one. So there's not this sort of history um, that we use and, and, and known effective sort of strategies for, for mitigating these, these attacks. Um, and, and it's just, you know, and, and quite frankly, a lot of the playbooks, a lot of the effective mitigation techniques, they're not sexy, right? Take ransomware, right? You know, ransomware is just absolutely out of control and has been for the past, you know, five years, certainly the past two years, right? And everybody's talking about ransomware, ransomware, ransomware. Well, you know, when you think about ransomware, you know, I mean, ransomware is you know, the, the way in which you protect against ransomware is not really cybersecurity. It's IT, right? You, you, if you can, you patch your systems, right? And certainly in terms of how you recover is you have, you have good backups, both on site and off site. And then you have a way to, to make sure you can restore those backups. That's, but Backups is not sexy. Backups, you're not going to hear people talking about backups at DEF CON or Black Hat, right? Um, you know, what, what they will talk about is some, you know, interesting novel way in which, you know, some, some threat actors or, you know, cyber criminal gangs carried out the ransomware against, you know, attack against some, you know, entity or whatever. And even, even those techniques aren't all that novel. They tend to be of the phishing variety and or, you know, vulnerability of some unpatched system. And so, you know, and that's not cool. That's not sexy to talk about that stuff, right? It's, it's much more interesting to talk about, you know, machine learning applied to cybersecurity or whatever, you know, the shiny new object is. And it seems to be sort of not an attention span for, for the, you know, what I call the blocking and tackling, the fundamentals, um, right? Um, you know, good backups and restoring backups and backups on site and off site. And so, you know, I don't, Kevin, I really don't know what it's going to take to fix these problems. You know, if folks aren't willing to, to implement some of the foundational IT stuff, um, backups, for example, on-site and off-site, or, you know, or try to try to have some sort of a strategy for patching those systems you can, or try to segment your networks as best you can, or try to implement some sort of um, asset inventory um, so you can figure out what stuff you need to defend, or if you don't understand what your threat model is that is what what are the what are the things you have that a criminal wants and then how how are you going to prioritize your defenses of those things if you're not doing that stuff you know i'm not i'm not sure we're really gonna gonna move the needle you know and in terms of sort of software um you know it just seems like um you know to some degree we're making the same sorts of mistakes we were making 40 years ago kevin and i were talking before this started 
he's a full stack developer and you know we're talking about kevin was sharing you know boy if we could if we could just do input validation you know if we could get software developers to just validate the input especially you know user provided input um and you know and tr and, and deal with that sort of treat that you know as non-executable code and do certain things with it right um boy we would you know we'd really we'd be pretty far along in terms of the security of software um or you know when we've made some progress you know with stack based buffer overflows i think we've come a long way and primarily because of protection measures that have been integrated in operating systems microsoft's done a lot in this space um kudos to them but you know we're still you know speaking of input validation you know we're programmers are still using libraries that are the poster children for stack based buffer overflows, for example, or, you know, we're still doing a cruddy job of validating input, we still have buffer overflows, and we've known how to fix buffer overflows since 19 whatever 77, <laughs> you know, so, you know, I don't, I don't know how we're really gonna, you know, I don't, I don't mean to sound so jaded and, and sort of negative, you know, it is a little depressing because you know having been in the space a long time you know we're still making the same sorts of mistakes and so you know that's do, a, a, do you think uh this is a place where possibly uh legislation might be effective like if we pass a law saying like for your ransomware example you have to do backups and we make the financial penalty if you don't like so high that they'd actually do it like, is that an approach worth exploring? Or do you think that would solve the problem? I think some regulation would work, maybe not of the variety you described, but perhaps for software vendors, right? Organizations that develop software, you know, if there was some sort of financial penalty for the, the cruddy software that they keep peddling, I, I think that certainly would, uh, I, I think that certainly would make a difference. You know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm in the education and commercial training space and have been for most of my professional career, you know, both as a, as a contractor and then as an educator and, um, you know, and for the most part, software programming or software development, for the most part in, in this country is taught at the four year level, certainly community colleges have programs, but it's mainly the four year schools and it's, you know, it's primarily in the computer science departments at four year schools and you know, for the most part, that curriculum has not changed um, in a lot of years, primarily because, you know, it's foundational. Um, but, you know, that being said, you know, you don't see a lot of secure coding practices integrated in that curricula. And I get it, it's challenging, you know, credits are tight, there's only so many credits you have to work with. And, and so, you know, security sort of an afterthought. And so, you know, as generation upon generation over the past, whatever, 40 years that, you know, essentially are not learning some of these effective practices. And if you want a good resource for, for, for secure coding practices, you could look to the to the OWASP, the Open Web Applications, Application Security Project, excuse me, OWASP.org, I think. And while web W is the, is the operative word and letter in that acronym, they they develop a top 10 risks to web applications many of which can apply to 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 other sorts of of apps that are that are not web based um you know input validation for example being a being a good example um, but you don't see a lot of those secure coding practices implemented certainly even discussed and so you know again another generation of students who essentially you know are coming out of these programs um where you know it's you get get the program to compile um sort of as the as the bar um so unless we make changes sort of in the education space and in the training um you know or perhaps some sort of a a financial penalty th penalty through regulation to these companies developing this cruddy software you know i don't know you know i don't know what what sort of changes will happen um daniela sent a chat that said bruce schneier published click here to kill everybody and he talks extensively about ot risks as part of the it ecosystem really good book thank thanks for that daniela um he also just has a great blog in general um and sort of keeps his pulse on you know lots of interesting things as it relates specifically to the things that that this group is interested in um so thanks for that daniela 
Owen, um, are bad actors associated with nation states going after American OT systems the way they are with IT systems more generally? Um, I, yes, I mean, I think that's part of most, um, most um, state sponsored um, groups is to have some sort of capability um, for, um, for, for, o, for OT systems, not all. I mean, you know, certain countries sort of specialize, you know, generally speaking, um, you know, Chinese um, state-sponsored hackers are interested in espionage. It doesn't mean that they're not carrying out attacks that um, are, are financially motivated, or it doesn't mean they're carrying out attacks against um, the U.S.'s critical infrastructure. Um, you know, Russia typically has been very interested in the U.S.'s critical infrastructure, um, as are, you know, we're interested in uh, cyber espionage and, you know, and penetrating our adversaries um, um, critical infrastructure systems as well. You know, I hope that in the case of industrial control systems with state sponsored actors that there sort of be this mutually assured destruction, if you will, you know, that that was so prominent in the, in the height of the Cold War, especially the 80s between, you know, Russia and the US, you know, sort of, okay, we can, we can, we can kill you 400 times over, you can kill us 400 times over. So we'll agree not to, 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 to kill each other 400 times over. And the same, you know, same sort of, you know, diplomatic conversations happening um, with, with, um, you know, with countries, you know, um, uh, I'm more worried about the rogue actor, if you will, um, especially as more and more devices with internet connectivity embedded in them, right? Some sort of a networking stack that allows them to be connected to the internet, get put on in these operational technology environments, um, right? It doesn't necessarily take a, uh, a state-sponsored uh, attacker to compromise one of these, um, you know, one of these systems, right? Especially when they're using such poor, when they have such poor security measures in place, you know, that sort of scares me more. Um, second part of that question, because the bad actors don't have physical access to OT devices and sensors, is the U.S. somewhat safer with these? Not necessarily. You know, I think the U.S. is, you know, any of the developed country, any, any of countries who are who are more connected are are higher are at a higher risk than less connected countries, and you know, and and more and more organizations that are putting these IoT devices on their networks are at, at greater risk, um, prim primarily because again, many of these uh, IoT devices come with, you know, they come with a an operating system running a web server. With default credentials and you know and and protocols that send commands and 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 data and whatnot in the clear um, and are not segmented and are physically direct in some cases directly connected to the internet right so um, they're they're sort of I don't know if we're somewhat safer in that regard. Ham's lab said Schneider's blog also has great discussions in the comment threads. It does. Yeah. So thanks for the questions, comments. Um, as, I said, as I said, uh, this ends when we want it to end. So does uh, anybody else have some final questions they want to get in? I'm so sorry. I've got, oh, that was my sound things on my end. But yeah, um, let's see. And uh, yes, just to reiterate, this will be available on our YouTube channel shortly for those who want to watch it. Um, also, I will just add real quick that for those who are interested, we will be hosting a, a virtual happy hour in a gather town space, which is, if you haven't done that before, it is basically a, um, you know, it's kind of like an old 8-bit video game, but when you get close to people, Zoom chat windows pop up. It's way more fun than trying to have a social gathering in here, and there isn't the constant wall of eyes on you. You can, like in real life, wander away from people if you're bored of a conversation or sick of people staring at you. So I'm going to post the, uh, the link um, 
here in the chat for anyone who's interested in joining us. Um, I will leave this room open for a little bit, just so those of you, so you can get the link and transfer over if you want to. I, um, you know, I will wait in there, you know, at least five to 10 minutes for people to trickle in. You know, if nobody comes, great. We just like to offer this option. It really varies from month to month. But if you've enjoyed this and missed the ability to go get a drink at the bar afterwards of an in-person gathering, this is the best alternative we can offer. So of course, uh, Casey and Owen and, and David are all welcome. And of course, uh, any of our guests are welcome to join us uh, as well. We'd love to see you. Um, do we have any uh, final questions for Casey before I end the official presentation? Evan, there's one Evan, uh, he's still on yes. that I said I'd come back to. Evan asked oh, yes. Yes. If, uh, if I have any suggestions or resources for someone who wants to get into security as an occupation. Uh, you know, what I would say, Evan, is the first thing that would be helpful for you to figure out is, do you want to do technical stuff? Are you interested in helping organizations write policies? Um, are you interested in the legal aspects? Are you interested in human resources, personnel? Um, if you're interested in technical, what sort of technical stuff? Do you like writing software? Do you like connecting computers together? Um, do you like administering systems? And if you don't, if you don't know the answer to any of those questions, that's fine, Evan. But those are those will help sort of get you um, on, on a right path, right? I, I'm I'm sort of biased. I think that having a technical background is really helpful regardless if you're going to do technical stuff and and, and that 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 doesn't mean programming it mean it mean it might be helpful it means just sort of having an understanding of fundamentals of IT systems you know I mean, you know what's what's an operating system and how do I administer one and set up user accounts and how, how do you you know generally connect systems together and um, you know, what's the hardware involved in computing systems? And, um, you know, that, that sort of foundation is really critical if you want to do technical cybersecurity stuff. Uh, and that's, or a lot of organizations don't get that. There's this huge demand for cybersecurity talent and most organizations, their, their solution to the problem is to just essentially poach this very small percentage of cybersecurity specialists that exist, right? And they don't really look internally to the strengths and weaknesses of their own folks, not weaknesses, but the strengths of their own, their own folks. And they, and they don't really understand quite frankly, what they're looking for. Ransomware was, is a good example, you know, ransomware, you know, the ways in which you mitigate ransomware, they're not cybersecurity measures. And so if you're looking for cybersecurity people to fix your ransomware, you know, stuff, um, you know, you, you, you're sort of missing the boat there. I mean, you're going to have to hire cybersecurity people if you are a victim of ransomware to come in and do some forensics analysis, you know, do some incident response. But, right, I'm talking about before the incident happens, right? That's sort of IT stuff. And so um, have certainly, if you want to do technical stuff, Evan, having an IT technical background is, is going to be an absolute requirement. You know, some, some of the best penetration testers in the world, folks that get paid to break into systems for a living, they started as system administrators. They started as folks administering systems or they started in help desk and then they moved their way to system administration, right? And what makes them really good at breaking into systems is that they had to set up and administer and secure systems, right? Um, and so that's sort of my general advice to you, Evan, and, you know, and my contact information is there, my email. And if, you know, if you, if you sort of think about those questions that I pose back to you or, or just areas to think about what, what may interest you, I'm happy to set up a, a call or, or whatnot. And so I'll sort of help you think through that some more. And then at that point I could provide, I could provide tons of resources. Um, so all right, hopefully that helps, Evan. I think that was all the, I think we got to all the questions though, Kevin. I think we did. I don't recall one that was missed. Um, yeah, so uh, I think we're good. And uh, 
this uh, feels like a good place to stop. I, I think we've hit the uh, discussion from many angles, so I'm not uh, thinking we missed something we need to go over. So if nobody has any more questions, we can let things adjourn here. Once again, I shared the link to the Gather Town in the uh, chat. You click that link and then there'll basically be a place you click on on that website to go to the actual uh, gathering. Um, and in case you just drop his email if you want to connect with him. Also, I will just quickly drop my email. Most, a lot of you have it, but if you need to connect with me for some reason, you're always welcome to email me. And I also can get you in touch with people like Casey. So there you go. Oh, and of course, and that is my dog if somebody heard that. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah. I will see those of you who are interested in the Gather Town. I'll probably stay there for a few minutes. Everybody is welcome to join. Um, so yeah, um, once again, thank you, Casey, for a great presentation. Um, we'll have to have you back sometime. I always enjoy people that every couple of years I can hit them up and seeing what they're working on. But this was very informative and I really appreciate you for shedding a light on something that even those of us in this space may not know a lot about, but is just gonna keep becoming more important in this interconnected world. And uh, thank you all for attending and bearing with uh, that I had to uh, lock things down a little more, it's just how it goes. But um, yeah, in Gather Town, it'll, it's a little more freewheeling. So, you know, uh, if you were sad you couldn't chat, that will be a thing there. But anyway, great to see all of you. Hope to see you all next month. We really appreciate you sticking with us during these very difficult, weird times. And I will reiterate, we look forward to when we can gather in Meet Space with you again. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>